Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our first election protection briefing here from the Biden-Harris campaign. Tomorrow is election day, obviously, uh, and we wanted to make sure that we give you all an update on what we're seeing across the country. And we also wanted to discuss what Trump is trying to do to create chaos in our electoral process. Our plan is to do these regularly over today, tomorrow, um, so that we're always here to give you the information that we're seeing uh, and that we're going back and forth on that. Uh, it was reported yesterday that President Trump um, believes that if he wins the East Coast battleground states, Florida, North Carolina, and Georgia, he plans to go out and declare victory. And we want to be clear with you, if he tries to do that, that will not be true. Just declaring victory without actually having won um, in the kind of states uh, that we're talking about here uh, is really basically trying to say that COVID is over, even though we know it's not. Uh, and all the evidence is saying that COVID in this country continues. And so we want to be clear with all of you. We want to make sure uh, that we're having this dialogue and share with you what we're seeing and that we also want to be fundamentally clear what we uh, believe to be true. Under no scenario will Donald Trump uh, be declared a victory, a victor on election night. And we think that that's really fundamental to how we want to approach tomorrow. So as we uh, think about uh, where we're headed, um, we really want to take a minute to talk about where we've come from. And so uh, fundamental to that is this record turnout um, that really puts the vice president in a significant advantage coming into election day. Both in person and mail have been, uh, early vote have been occurring over the course of uh, the last several days and months in some instances, where we have over 93 million people, Americans, having voted early. Uh, at this point in 2016, um, there was about 58 million total. So such a significant difference, so much enthusiasm behind what we're seeing in early vote. And as we look to our core battleground states, we have 17 of them, we see that roughly 50 million people have voted across our battleground states. Um, we believe that that puts the vice president and Democrats in a real advantage. We see really strong uh, turnout overall across all of our battleground states. And we are also seeing success when it comes to mail-in voting. We are seeing roughly 200 million voters um, in 45 states voting by mail. And what we're also seeing as we look under the hood um, and we coordinate and, and get more information here is that people are doing it and, and their, their rejection rates of vote by mail is incredibly sm small. It's very low. For example, in Florida, um, as of November 1st, we're seeing a rejection rate of 0.3%. So we've had millions and millions and millions of people vote already in Florida. And there is only a small portion of people that have had their ballots rejected. That is great for democracy. It is great because people are doing the right thing. Uh, in Michigan, we see the statewide rejection rate uh, is now 0.4%. And in Wisconsin, it is 0.1%. Even though in Wisconsin, the majority of voters so far have voted by mail. This tells us that people know the rules, they're motivated by that, and they are following the instructions that they need to in order to, to vote. And we're going to continue to see that tomorrow and throughout the day. We believe that the early vote numbers are, they really speak for themselves. We are seeing such tremendous uh, turnout across the country. In our battleground states, as you can see here, um, we are seeing 50, 60, 70 percent of our total expected turnout turning out already. And we're seeing that we're going to come into, the Vice President and Senator Harris are going to come into Election Day with a significant advantage. Leads like ours and what we're seeing will be difficult to overcome on Election Day. Uh, we really believe um, that we come into Election Day with a strong advantage. Um, our strategy from day one was to encourage uh, early voting. To We've been saying since the convention that it's important to vote early, and we've been building our program to do that. Um, we've been building our program to make sure we understood who was out there voting, and we were helping them do that and execute uh, that strategy. We believe in our critical states. Um, we are focused on making sure we're closing out the early vote window in the states that are uh, still early voting, and then we are pushing to Election Day. In some of our core states, uh, we see that we have really strong leads in places like 
North Carolina and Wisconsin. And those leads are really important uh, for us to think about what that means for Election Day. And what it means for Election Day is that with our advantage coming into uh, North Carolina, where we estimate about 87% of the projected vote is already in, um, we believe that Trump is going to need 62% of the votes on Election Day in order to win. Uh, we look to play a place like Wisconsin, obviously, again, a very important state for our path to, vis to victory, where we see 60% of turnout already in. And our belief, based on what we're looking at at our projections, the data that we have for early vote, the data that we have on expectations on turnout on Election Day, we believe Trump would have to get to 61% of the vote on Election Day in order to win. And just to put that in context, in North Carolina in 2016, Trump won 56% of the vote, and now he needs to get uh, 62 in Wisconsin. He won 53% uh, of the vote. He'll need to get to 61%. And then finally in Arizona, a state that's majority vote by mail, where we've seen nearly 80% of ballots cast already, Trump would need to get 60% of the remaining votes to win. I want to highlight, especially in Arizona, that that includes vote-by-mail ballots in Maricopa County that haven't been counted yet and we believe will significantly break for us. So we still think there are a lot of votes out uh, for us as well. So it is certainly not impossible, um, but it is important to just say that we come into Election Day with a signif significant advantage. So I just walked through those states for a very deliberate reason, um, not only because we think we're going to win them, but also because they're in different time zones. And so let's talk a little bit about the timing on election night. You will see on this slide uh, the timing of when polls close across the country on election night. We are obviously working across the full country, so we will be dealing with different time zones and different poll closing times. Our first polls are going to close um, in Georgia and Virginia at 7 p.m. By 8 p.m., we're going to have North Carolina, Florida, Michigan uh, will also be closed. Uh, and then Wisconsin um, will be closing around 9 o'clock p.m., uh, as well as Arizona and Nevada closing at 10. So you can imagine the counting and the results will all be correlated to when the polls close. Um, and so what does that mean, you're asking? Well, it means that um, there are really two important things to think about. So first of all, just to be clear, we believe any voter that's in line when the polls close should have a right to cast their ballot. So if you are in line, if you are a voter, stay in line so that you can vote. That is your legal right. You need to go do that. But also, we need to know that, of course, uh, in, uh, across these states, we won't have all the ballots that will be counted when the polls close. And we won't even have them all on election night. And that has been in the history of how election nights have been done in this country, where not all of the ballots have been counted on election night. We know that is going to be true uh, this year as well. And it is no different than any other time. And that is not something that uh, Donald Trump should make you think is, is bad or wrong. It is the way it works. Obviously, in each of our different states, um, there are different rules for counting ballots because it's driven locally. And that will definitely impact the timing of the states coming in. We expect states like Georgia and Florida and North Carolina, states that have counted their vote by mail and their early, early uh, ballot votes earlier um, and started earlier, will be coming in earlier on election night. We also know that in states that we care deeply about, where we see our path to victory, we're going to see some slower reporting. So let's talk just a few minutes about that. Pennsylvania does not count early votes or mail-in ballots until Election Day. So they don't start until tomorrow morning to count the millions of votes that have come in before Election Day. So that means we expect that count to be late. In 2016, I think that it was called in Pennsylvania around 1.30 in the morning. It's probably going to be later than that because we have a significantly higher amount of early votes that will be voted, um, that have already been voted in 2020 that we didn't have in, in 2016. In Michigan, there is also a pretty limited ability to pre-count ballots in a number of the jurisdictions in the state. We uh, know that's always been the case. Historically, we've seen slower reporting out of Michigan. And we also know that in Michigan, some localities will not release 
all of their absentee ballot counts, which is their, the way Michigan talks about vote by mail, absentee ballots, until they're all completely counted. So that would mean we're probably not going to see those results until uh, the next day. Um, but we know that's the case. That's the way historically it's always been, and those ballots ha are, are going are gonna to be counted. They're just going to be a little bit slower. Um, and then Wisconsin as well, um, several counties, um, particularly ones that um, are, are larger, uh, like uh, Milwaukee, have central counting. So that means that all the ballots are counted together, and then they're dispersed back to the precincts for reporting. So this means it's just going to have some added delays in how they count their ballots, uh, and will mean that we're probably not going to have the full accounting on election night. But again, none of that is to be surprising. It's always been the way it's been. Um, and you can imagine counties that are smaller, they're going to go sooner. Counties that are larger will probably go later. Um, and so we might see earlier on in election night counts that are coming in that are from these smaller counties. Maybe they're a little bit more rural. Maybe they're more favorable to Donald Trump. But that is not uh, determining anything except saying that those counties are in and other counties aren't, as we'd expect. So when Donald Trump says that ballots counted after midnight should be invalidated, he's just making that up. Basically, uh, there is no historical precedent that any of our elections have ever run and been counted and completely verified on election night. We do not expect that to happen in 2020. And we know uh, that all the ballots aren't going to be reported on, on election night. And, and in fact, that's not just our supporters. That's going to be his supporters, too. It's also going to be uh, our military overseas who have turned in their ballots. It's also going to be our, our COVID frontline workers. Um, you know, those are the people, uh, just like anyone else, uh, based on how a state is counting that could come in on election night or could come in uh, in the days and the hours after that. And that is something that, uh, you know, we believe every vote should be counted as it always has been. So just to highlight, obviously, we've dug in a little bit on um, the states. You know, one of the things that we're trying to really focus here on is that Trump is going to try to go out there and declare victory in an unfounded way um, at an early point, right? He's already said that. We know that. So what does that mean? Well, it means that for us, it is very important for everyone to understand our pathways to victory. We come into Election Day with several different pathways to get to 270 electoral votes. Donald Trump has a very narrow path to win. He needs to win Florida. It is key to his path to victory. Uh, and we uh, really um, can win to get to 270 without Florida, which is a significant advantage. We're going to fight and we're going to go get Florida. Um, but we don't need it to get to 270. So I want to walk you through a couple of hypotheticals just to give you a sense of how competitive we are uh, and that we're not writing off any state. So if we just win uh, one state between North Carolina and Georgia, then we could lose Michigan and Florida and still get over 270 electoral votes. If we win uh, North Carolina, uh, you know, that is kind of central to what we've heard Donald Trump saying uh, and his campaign saying on their path to victory. We are coming into Election Day in North Carolina with a five-point advantage. So that is significant. And if we win North Carolina, that really puts us in a good position. Um, if Trump wins Florida, North Carolina, and Georgia, like he said he's going to do, um, and whether or not it's true or, or called, um, it still uh, doesn't mean he's on his path to 270. Even if he won all three of those states, and this is a really important point, even if he wins those states and those states are going to be counted earlier, Biden still has a clear and viable path to 270 electoral votes. And that path is through our easiest path, the Midwest and Pennsylvania path, um, where we believe that we are well positioned in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin. We know those states in particular are coming in later, but we think we're going to win those states. That is our clearest path to 270. Uh, and even if Donald Trump wins some of these other states that are a little bit tighter, uh, the, the chance and the advantage that we we come into Election Day on these key states um, really puts us on that path to 270 with our Midwest and Pennsylvania pathway. So hopefully that gives you a sense both that what Donald Trump is out there saying doesn't live up to historical precedent or the facts, that we are well positioned with multiple pathways to victory, that we know that we are going to have a very good sense on Election Day. Uh, the strength of our support and how it matches to our expectations coming out of early vote with that 
really historic enthusiasm, and that really puts us in the driver's seat on election day. But at the end of the day, we believe we're going to win this race. We are going to believe we're going to be able to do that with our pathways to victory, regardless of what Donald Trump says. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to hand this over to Bob Bauer to talk to you a little bit more about the administration of the election as we've seen it through early vote and election integrity as we move into these final hours. Thank you very much, Jen. As you can see, election protection or is active around the country and election officials are performing extraordinarily well. Uh, they are putting on an election in which over 90 million Americans have voted. And I'll talk a little bit about what we've seen over the course of, of this period of time. But it's important to stress that we have seen this election be conducted this successfully under unprecedentedly difficult conditions. Uh, with a pandemic uh, that clearly in the spring really unsettled the administration of elections, created considerable concerns about what would happen uh, in the fall. And huge efforts were underway across the states by election officials in collaboration with civil society, voting rights organizations, to try to make sure that Americans were afforded their full opportunity to vote even under these difficult conditions, including in jurisdictions that had to ramp up their vote by mail operations, do something they'd never been able to do before, which required a significant amount of preparation. And in fact, this was uh, successfully achieved. Uh, we have now in this country, uh, active throughout this period of time, well over 11,500 early vote locations. And nearly 200 million Americans have had the option to vote by mail without a traditional excuse. So we have had access to voting in different modes, and Americans have taken advantage of it, and election officials have provided it in a way, as I said, we might not have expected six or eight months ago, and it has gone extraordinarily well. I want to stress, as Jen has just a few minutes ago, that what we are also seeing is that the error rate that we might have expected, leading to rejection of ballots, has been remarkably low. Again, a tri tribute to the effort that these election officials have made. Now, what is the election protection program that we have contributing to this ongoing effort in collaboration with election officials around the country? Uh, we have the most highly resourced election protection program in modern American presidential history. There's absolutely no question about it in terms of numbers, scope, and sophistication. And what we have discovered is, again, working with election officials around the country, we have seen over this period of time minimal incidents minimal incidents of voters having difficulty accessing their right to vote. More than nine out of 10 of the over 170,000 calls that were made to our voter protection hotline since September are about things that you, know, you might expect, finding a polling place and how to request a ballot, not related to any serious voting-related protection problem. When incidents are reported, they've ranged from relatively minor issues. Occasionally, a voter will call in and say, we didn't like the advertisement we just saw on television, or more serious questions that can be readily rectified, like whether or not everybody within the polling place is adhering to mask-wearing protocols. Now, part and parcel of this election protection program is the work of our poll workers, and we have thousands of poll workers around the country who have stepped up, particularly after the trouble this spring, and have performed phenomenally well. And our campaign has deployed thousands of poll observers uh, to assist election officials in identifying and addressing particular problems. An example might be uh, that a voter uh, is concerned because he or she is convinced uh, that they have the correct ID with them, there's some confusion at the polling place, and we work with election officials to solve the problem. Uh, other problems might be that a polling location had to be moved, for example, in Georgia because of Hurricane Zeta. The polling location is moved, the campaign steps in with the help of uh, poll observers and the voter protection force to advise voters about where that polling location has been relocated, update IWillVote.com, alert the hotline, contact voters directly. So that's what these poll observers do. They're around the country doing what is necessary to facilitate access uh, to the right to vote. And they have performed extraordinarily well. So let's go uh, to the noise that we hear from uh, the 
direction of Donald Trump and uh, his Republican Party. I think it's fairly clear, particularly from the rhetoric of recent days, that he's exhibiting an increasing level of desperation. But let me read to you uh, an extraordinary quotation uh, whose author I know, uh, whose author is actually an expert in election law, and whose author is a diehard Republican. He wrote uh, just recently, and I quote, President Trump has failed the test of leadership. His bid for re-election is foundering, and his only solution has been to launch an all-out multi-million dollar effort to disenfranchise voters, unquote. That's Benjamin Ginsburg, longtime Republican, general counsel to the Romney for President campaign in 2012, uh, lawyer for the Republican National Committee and the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee. He's as Republican as I'm a Democrat. And he's appalled by what he's seen in the rhetoric and the bluffs and the threats that he's hearing from Donald Trump. But here's the reality. The American people will decide the result of the election. They always have for the past 200 years, and they are voting in record numbers. They'll decide who the president will be. As Jen said, it is absurd for the president to suggest that there is any significance at all to his declaring victory on election night. He has no constitutional legal right to declare himself the president. We have an election. It's a constitutional and legal process. It is driven by the choice of the voters, and that's what will decide who the next president will be. So when you hear the noise out of election night uh, from the direction of Donald Trump, if you read the tweets, if you read the tweets of some of his supporters echoing what he's saying, just ignore it. Uh, there's nothing to it. Now, there is one thing I do want to stress. You might have been reading that there have been sporadic outbreaks of sort of prankishness and disruption around uh, communities getting ready to vote. Uh, Occasionally, uh, Trump supporters will show up at a particular location and they'll behave aggressively. We have found that immediately law enforcement is notified and as soon as law enforcement appears, uh, these Trump supporters uh, disperse. And that's what recently happened at a county in Florida. You may have also heard of so-called Trump train, sort of, you know, sporadic, apparently sort of uh, organized, moderately organized groups of cars traveling through neighborhoods with Trump signs honking horns and apparently attempting to harass and in some cases outright intimidate voters. Um, let's be clear about something. Federal, state, and local law enforcement have issued advisories that voter intimidation is illegal and will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. If you observe this behavior near a polling place, call our hotline and we will work with law enforcement to make sure the issue is addressed. If you observe this behavior in the community at large and it is creating either an impediment to traffic or it is creating concern in the community, please notify local law enforcement. They know what to do. They've been heard this morning. You'll hear from them throughout the day. This will not be tolerated. We will take care of this and we'll work with law enforcement to make sure uh, our voters are protected and the process is protected. Now, let me, uh, let me close by saying this. As I've said a minute ago, uh, our campaign has the largest, best voter protection program ever, and it's working very, very well as the results to date demonstrate. But election officials have also performed extraordinarily well all around the country. Election officials, both Democratic and Republican, who d intend to deliver uh, the right to vote uh, to the citizens in their communities. And if there's anything that demonstrates conclusively that the Trump vote suppression program and vote suppression rhetoric will fail, it's what we've seen of this extraordinary performance to date on the part of our voters turning out, voting in record numbers, and really blazing the path for our democracy. So we have every reason to be hopeful, uh, and we are confident and ready for Election Day to take place tomorrow successfully. And to the extent that there are issues, we assure you they'll be addressed immediately and successfully. Thank you very much. So what does that mean for all of you? Well, it means that there really is only one thing left to do. We feel good about where we are, where we're positioned. We are not distracted by whatever Donald Trump is going to try to throw out there and create a reality that is not real. But we need to keep pushing. So we need to make sure you vote. And if you're here watching us, you're probably already voting. But we need your help making sure your friends your families, your neighbors, that cousin you haven't talked to in a long time, um, you know, the kid of uh, your neighbor who wasn't sure if they were interested in voting, 
We need your help. Go talk to them. It is going to take every single one of us to have a resounding voice on Election Day to show that the American people are taking their country back, that we are going to vote, the American people are going to decide this, and we need your help to do it. So go to IWillVote.com for any of your questions to find out where you need to go vote and keep pushing because we can do hard things on this campaign and we appreciate all that you're doing out there. We just need to keep voting and make sure that Vice President Biden and Senator Harris take it over the top on Election Day. All right, I think we're ready for some questions now. doing this. I had a question uh, for Bob first. The president has said at uh, that on election night that he is planning to send in his lawyers. What do you make of that? And can you also talk about what your efforts will be to counter that? And then, Jen, um, on election night, if the president goes out there and declares victory, uh, or even if he doesn't, uh, do you, what is the plan for Biden? Will we hear from him on election night or in those early hours of Wednesday morning, even if this race hasn't been called? Well, to respond first, I think it's very telling that uh, President Trump is focused not on his voters, but on his lawyers. And his lawyers are not going to win the election for him. There's no question about it. We are fully prepared uh, for, you know, any legal hijinks of one kind or another. We're not worried about it. We think that it is very clear uh, that uh, for a period of time, in a variety of ways, uh, the Trump campaign has attempted quite unsuccessfully uh, to persuade everybody that there is uh, some potential problem with this election that is the only possible reason that he could lose. The case he's turning over to his lawyers when the voter has spoken is a case that no lawyer can win and his lawyers will not win it. So we're going to match them, uh, I assure you, uh, and exceed them in quality and vigor, and we'll protect the vote. And then on election night, you know, look, I think we believe that the level of data we have, all the early vote that's in, and what we're going to see on election day is going to give us a very good sense of where we're headed, even if all the votes aren't counted. And, and again, as I just laid out, we know that some are going to come in early. We know that some are going to come in later, but we're going to be able to track that either way, because even in the Pennsylvania's, Wisconsin's and Michigan's, data will be flowing. Votes will be, will be counted at some point, just not all of them. So because of that, we're going to be really focused on our understanding of where we are. And my expectation is that the vice president will address the American people um, probably late. Um, but we're not really concerned about what Donald Trump says on election night or what he might want to convey. And that's why it's so important for us to have this kind of conversation, because what he says might have nothing to do with the reality of it. So we're not going to get distracted by that or worry about what he does or what he's going to say he's going to do. We're going to use our data, our understanding of where this is headed, and make sure that the vice president uh, is addressing the American people. Hey, guys. I think I'm unmuted now. Um, I appreciate these briefings. I guess I want to follow up a little bit on the question you just answered from Arlette, because it sounds like you're saying it doesn't really matter what the president says, but it could very well be that 40 percent of the country hears him say, I won. And I guess I just think it's important to see if you guys think that Biden's role in this is to say to the rest of the country, like, let's slow our role and wait if that's actually what happens on election night. So I think part of the responsibility is the media's as well as us to be clear that if Donald Trump is suggesting that he's won, but it is not based in fact or reality, then we have a responsibility. Everyone has a responsibility to push back on that and put the caveats out there that we're conveying. And that's why we're being so transparent about what we're seeing. We would never typically do these kind of 
uh, briefings to go through the detail, and we're doing it because we have nothing to hide. We just want to make sure we're sharing that information. At the same time, the vice president, I believe, has had to um, serve as the voice of president for so much of this campaign and so much of the crisis that uh, many, the multiple crises that we've been facing in this country, it's being the, the only voice speaking out when we crossed the first 100,000 people dead, speaking to COVID. So I, I think that, you know, we do expect not only are we going to address the nation, but that the vice president will be the voice of of calm and leadership and unity uh, as he has this entire campaign and speaking to the American people about how this information uh, needs to be processed. But I also think we're trying to do everything we can ahead of time to make it clear that just because Donald Trump says something on election night or suggests he might be winning, uh, that is not going to be based in fact. There is no way he will be outright winning on election night. And so I think it's on all of our behalfs to really um, be clear and make sure that the American people do get a filter for that information because it won't be accurate. Hi guys, it's Lisa from PBS. Thank you for doing this. I'm gonna try and sneak in two questions, kind of a White House correspondent trick, I guess, even though I'm a Capitol Hill person. Um, first question is about security and we've seen reports about increasing concerns of militia, uh, militia's act activity, but also just violence in general, especially in some of the states you guys are looking at. Can you talk about your own security preparation for your campaign people, perhaps including the vice president as well? And then the second question, can you talk about the, the decisions about travel for these last couple of days, including the decision to go to Ohio? Bob, do you want to talk first and then I'll yes. go take the travel? Let me be very clear. And I think it's extremely important uh, in this conversation uh, between us and the media and in the media thinking about how it's going to report to the American people. A good bit of this discussion of unrest and so forth is intended to be suppressive. Threats are suppressive. The talk about violence is suppressive. It is important that voters understand that incidents are being dealt with. State, federal, and local law enforcement are on alert. But at the moment, uh, we believe there are incidents, they are sporadic, and it is extremely important that whatever happens uh, tomorrow is very carefully vetted, run to ground, so that what we don't have off of Twitter or off of rumors is this, of the suggestion uh, that there is widespread unrest and threat to voters and threat to the integrity and the safety of the polling place. We don't anticipate that will happen. We are confident from all the preparations we've made and what we've heard from state and local officials that they are more than ready across the board to assure that voters can vote safely and to address any of the activity that I briefly adverted to uh, earlier in, in my presentation. So uh, our view is, if. And we make ourselves available for that purpose. We have thousands of people on the ground. We're in regular touch with other civil society organizations that are monitoring the election. We're in touch with state and local officials. If there are questions, it's important that they get raised before, frankly, they're overreported or overheated in the reporting, because that itself could have a suppressive effect, and it would be a shame if that were the case. So that's our appeal, and we're glad to work with all of these other organizations to run these stories to ground and also to assure that issues as they develop are appropriately addressed. And on the travel, you know, we're carrying 17 battleground states, which, uh, you know, I can tell you from my 20 years in presidential campaigns is larger than any that we've ever had before. And we have ensured that we covered every single one of those battleground states across our candidates and our surrogates. We have, um, you know, uh, all of our candidates and our principals today in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have President Obama in Florida. We have surrogates everywhere. Um, you know, Ohio is like Iowa, is like Texas, is like, um, you know, these expansion states on both sides that, you know, frankly, are in play. And what we've seen coming into these, this final stretch is that more states are in play than less. And normally you would really kind of, um, you know, 
make your path to victory a little bit smaller. Uh, we've been able to expand that. And we've seen that with targeted investment and targeted travel and the early vote numbers that we've received and the modeled support that we see from the early vote, that places like Ohio and Iowa are in play. And they're in play even further if we keep pushing on turnout. So we feel uh, like we had a great event this morning in Cleveland. Um, you know, uh, we feel really good about those states that, you know, maybe we wouldn't have felt as good about earlier in the year, um, but they have really come on strong in the closing uh, weeks of this campaign. So thank you all so much. Uh, really appreciate the time. We're going to come back to you and do this uh, regularly. And please feel free to follow up with our campaign and our team uh, as uh, you're looking for additional information. But we um, continue to keep pushing forward. We're almost there. Uh, and we're excited to, to get to election night and to get to the next steps here. So thanks, everyone.